And then for those of you who are here, we'll wrap up. So the Arts Learning Grant, and I'll say this here, uh, has uh, the most um, requirements, I would say, of any category. You know, it really is a, a, a very, um, I don't want to use the word rigid, but it, ha it, has, it has benchmarks that you have to meet um, that we'll talk about. So this is uh, supports in-depth arts education projects to participants of all ages, led by nonprofit organizations, cultural groups, and or individual artists. Arts learning grants can take place either in school or outside of a school setting. And they're meant to build capacity for local artists and organizations while providing students and or community members with high quality artistic learning experiences. And so I'll highlight that again to say this, this is really focused on what it, of course, what is the benefit to the students? But we're also really interested in what is the benefit to the teaching artist? Is this giving teaching artists an opportunity to build up their resume, have more teaching experience? Um, so that is something we are very focused on. Oh, I'll point out this example, uh, ENTA, our education network for teaching artists out in Rhinebeck. Um, they have done great partnerships with Rhinebeck High School where they go in, I think they've gone into some media literacy classrooms and uh, done art projects. They've gone into other classrooms. They've gone to art classrooms um, and put on a really strong uh, series of, a focused series of sequential workshops um, with high school students. And um, in their situation, they typically end up working with multiple classes. Um, you're not required to work with multiple classes. You could work with one class, but depending on the school you're working with, they might want you to work with um, uh, multiple, uh, multiple classrooms. I used this example earlier. Uh, Susan Griss did a great, and we've had other groups do this too, actually, uh, did a great uh, workshop series at Woodland Pond, where she worked with uh, residents of that facility to do a dance workshop um, over at least three sessions. Um, the YMCA in uh, Kingston, their Starfish Summer Camp, did a great um, uh, series that was, again, only for uh, kids that were a part of that summer camp. Um, and there were some further require, like requirements on who could participate in that summer camp um, that they had set up. And so this was a great program that was focused on uh, building art skills, but in the context, context of talking about environmental issues. Um, so they did some really great projects there. Okay, now some goals for the Arts Learning Grant is to support nonprofit organizations, cultural groups, and individual artists in providing in-depth arts education projects to participants of all ages, build the capacity for local artists and nonprofit organizations while providing K through 12 public school students and or community members high quality artistic learning experiences, and supporting marginalized teaching artists and students through in-depth and hands-on arts education. Okay, who's eligible? So here are some of the benchmarks, stuff I'm talking about that these are really required for all arts learning grants. They must be sequential skill-based study that incorporates one or more art forms and includes a minimum of three hands-on learning sessions with the same instructor and the same group of students. And so when we say sequential skills-based, that means that each session should build on each other. It shouldn't be like each of the three sessions is a one-off they're building on each other. This typically happens in that it's one medium that is being focused on and it's the skills are being built over the three sessions. But there are some situations where it's more than one medium and maybe it's two mediums and they're really about introducing how those two mediums work can work together, for example. Um, so it's not restricted to one medium, but it is restricted to being sequential. Um, and it has to be the same instructor and the same group of students going through all three sessions together. So it shouldn't be like different instructor for each session or different group of students for each session. They should be hands-on and participatory creation. So these are not intended to be lecture series. They are hands-on arts creation. Um, and they can incorporate, as I said, one or more art forms. And it may culminate in an exhibition or uh, production or demonstration, but that is not required. We just get that question a lot is, can it culminate an exhibition? It certainly can, but it's not the focus of this program. Um, it's not a substitute for any of the three sessions, like a performance or an exhibition. 
Um, and, uh, you know, certainly you can if it's a part of your, your plan. Must include stated learning goals, methodologies and outcomes and a means for evaluation at the end of the sessions. And the programs may be in-person, virtual or hybrid. Requirements for in-school projects. So if the project is taking place in a public school, uh, it must take place during the school day and in a K through 12 public school setting. Private, parochial and home schools are ineligible to serve as partner schools. Um, and arts learning funds must not replace or appear to replace the role of certified arts teachers in schools. This is an additional offering. Um, students may not be taken out of regular class to participate or be self-selected for participation in the programming. So that's often achieved, you know, you're working with the school as a partner. So there you're working with a teacher, you know, the teacher's not going to teach that day because the teaching artist is going to teach. Uh, it shouldn't be like they're, you're going in a classroom saying like, hey, who wants to go do this program in the cafeteria? It should be already built into the student's day. Now, the other side of this is after school or community-based learning. And we use these terms because it's really just anything that's taking place outside of regular school hours. So this could include after school. If you're um, you know, doing a program after school, um, but it's taking place in a school setting, it is not an in-school project. It is an after-school project. Um, so, and then of course, you know, for example, the you know, summer camp, YMCAs, 4-H clubs, Girl Scout troops, senior living facilities, ESL programs. These are some examples of community-based learning, you know, stuff that's existing, closed groups that we have, we have done projects with before. Participants in these projects must be a part of an existing group. Example, as I just listed some examples, a club at a library, a social service organization, participants in education program participants, or senior center participants or residents, or something else. You know, these are just some examples. Projects may take place in a setting appropriate for the project. So that could be a library. It could be the nonprofit's location. It could be the, the location of the participants that are taking place, um, or it could be a school in after school. Um, participants can be a part of a specific age group or of any age. So you could say this is a something that's for all ages, you know, the group is of all ages, the existing group, or it could be, you know, all senior learners, all youth learners, whatever it might be. Allowable expenses. So um, teaching artist fees, as is the case with all of our categories, artist fees are the priority. Um, and so um, that is definitely a focus of our of what we're trying to fund um, direct administrative expenses and or planning or preparation expenses for the proposed uh, events uh, sessions uh, supplies and materials needed to execute the proposed project definitely a, a big one in this category if you want to get the materials so that you know they're reducing that you know they, that they're there for all the participants. And any efforts to increase accessibility to arts education programming, um, say that you need to hire translation services or additional um, support for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing or blind, um, so um, or physically have a physical disability or um, another disability that, you know, if there's any other support that has a, you know, funding amount, you know, an expense associated with it, that is something that would be a priority for funding. Ineligible expenses, the purchase of permanent equipment items, creation of textbooks, fees paid to board members of the nonprofit or nonprofit fiscal sponsor, and please see the guidelines for a complete list of expenses that are not eligible. A word on inclusion here. So arts learning grant funded projects are not open to the general public. This is the only category where it's not open to the general public. Uh, even still, uh, if you're going, if a teaching artist is going in to work with a group that, you know, um, uh, is part of a uh, marginalized group or an underrepresented group, to really have thoughtful uh, planning in place to make sure that everyone is going to be able to participate fully, that the content of what is being taught is relevant and is thoughtful, um, and, uh, you know, to... Um, ensure, uh, you know, to think about how you can create an inclusive learning environment for everyone who's going to participate. 
All right, and now I'll go over how you'll apply to the Arts Learning Grant. You'll see that there are a few different options depending on if it's an in-school project, out-of-school project, and if you're a nonprofit applying directly or if you're an individual. So nonprofits who are eligible must be a nonprofit 501c3 incorporated in Dutchess, Orange, or Ulster counties in New York State, must have a board of directors, must have a non-discrimination policy in place, and if you um, have applied to us previously, we will, uh, and we have your non-discrimination policy on file, we won't ask for it again. But if you're a new applicant or we don't have your non-discrimination policy on file, um, after you submit, we will reach out for this. And it, it should have been, you know, it, it can't be confirmed after you've submitted the application. This should have already been in place. Uh, must be an adherence of the Nonprofit Revitalization Act of 2013. If you need more information, excellent resource for that is the New York State Council on Nonprofits. Libraries, private universities, government entities, and tribal organizations are eligible. Ineligible organizations, public school districts cannot apply directly, public universities, New York State uh, agencies and departments, including SUNY schools, county level government agencies and departments, non-incorporated chapters of organizations whose parent organization is not incorporated in Dutchess, Orange, or Ulster County. Um, so, you know, that would be, you know, if you know that you're a chapter of an organization and the nonprofit is really incorporated and the EIN number is associated with an or a nonprofit that's incorporated in California or something, that would really be, you know, that's, you're not eligible you would need to, to find another way to apply. Our Smith Hudson and our staff and board are not eligible for the Arts Learning Grant or any of our grants. NISCA applicants are ineligible. So if, an, if you apply directly to the New York State Council on the Arts for funding in fiscal year 2023, you're not eligible. I know it says Community Arts Grant here, excuse me. You're not eligible to apply to Community Arts Grant, Arts Learning Grant, Individual Arts Commission, any of these um, funding categories. Um, and it, this is not as relevant for the arts learning grant, but NISCA applicants cannot benefit from any funded programs in any way. It could actually apply to the arts learning grant if there's some kind of final presentation. If you have questions about this, um, please reach out to me. I talk about this more when I went over the in-depth for the community arts grant. And um, if an organization applied directly to NISCA, you may not serve as a fiscal sponsor or a partner organization on any projects. Nonprofits applying directly, um, there are the attachments that you'll have to include, a staff list, board list, financial statement, and proof of nonprofit status. If you're applying directly for an out-of-school project, that is it. If you are applying for an in-school project as a nonprofit, you will also need to have a partner in school uh, who's eligible, and you'll submit a letter of commitment from the school. It's typically a letter from the principal on the school's letterhead. Nonprofits applying directly may also serve as a fiscal sponsor for unlimited projects. And I'll take a moment here to also say that um, we, you know, this is not something that you're com 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 and also as a community partner, you know, um, community partnership is not a part of the arts learning grant. But if you're a nonprofit applying directly to the arts learning grant, you can also serve as a fiscal sponsor or a community partner on the um, for a community arts grant. Um, it is not a knock against your application. You're not competing against yourself. If anything, I have heard panelists many times take notice of a nonprofit serving as a fiscal sponsor or community partner and having it be a benefit to them that they are helping others be able to access these funds. Okay, so now I'll go over how you apply as an individual or an unincorporated group. Um, individuals and unincorporated groups are encouraged and eligible to apply to this grant opportunity, and um, uh, there are a couple of ways that you can do so. So individual applicants uh, or contact persons for an unincorporated group must be at least 18 years of age at the time of submission and may not be enrolled in a full-time degree program must live in and have a legal address in Dutchess, Orange, or Ulster County, and must apply with a partner school for in-school projects or with a nonprofit serving as their fiscal sponsor for an after-school or community-based learning project. If you're applying with a partner school for an in-school project, the individual artist, group or collective, or unincorporated entity must partner with an eligible public school in order to do an in-school public project, 
And in this situation, the legal applicant is the individual artist or the contact person for the unincorporated group. That is who will sign the contract and who we will send the check to. When applying for an in-school project with a partner school, the individual applicant does not need a nonprofit fiscal sponsor. You do not need a, pro a nonprofit involved at all. You're applying with the partner school and the not individual artist or the unincorporated group is the legal applicant. If you're applying with a partner school as an individual or an incorporated group, this is what you'll need to provide. Proof of residency, documentation must be dated no earlier than 2022, and you'll see a full list in the guidelines of acceptable proofs of residency, and um, a letter of commitment uh, when applying, uh, sorry, with a partner school. And uh, they, uh, it, as with, uh, as I just mentioned before, it's typically uh, on the school's letterhead signed by the principal. Fiscal sponsorship. This is only for projects that are not occurring during the school day. So individual artists, groups or collectives or unincorporated entities um, must be fiscally sponsored by an eligible nonprofit organization or in order to apply for an after school or community based learning project. Key points here are that in the case of fiscal sponsorship, the nonprofit is the legal applicant. They are who we will send the check to and who we will sign the contract with. Funds will pay, be paid directly to them, and then they will pass the funds along to the sponsored artist or pay out funds, you know, however the arrangement is set up. The project must take place in the county uh, where the fiscal sponsor is located. The sponsored individual slash group must be located in Dutchess, Orange, or Ulster County. The fiscal sponsor is not, uh, so the, uh, take a step back and say here that this is an opportunity that if you're a teaching artist in Ulster County and you really want to do an out-of-school project, you know, an, a, 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 a workshop series in Dutchess County, then you could find a nonprofit fiscal sponsor in Dutchess County. They're the legal applicant. The money is going to Dutchess County and, and that's all perfectly fine. The fiscal sponsor is not required to make a financial contribution to the project. Applicants may select this option, uh, fiscal sponsorship, if they do not wish funds to be paid directly to them or if they require greater administrative support from a nonprofit organization. If you're doing fiscal sponsorship, we will need all the documents that would be required of the nonprofit if they were applying directly. This includes a staff list, board list, financial statement, and proof of nonprofit status. You can see the guidelines for details on all of these. Just note, towns and cities do not need to submit uh, most of these. Um, you'll see that noted in the application. And a letter of agreement. So you'll, uh, the template of this is available on our website, signed by the fiscal sponsor. It's what you'll use to lay out the terms of the fiscal sponsorship. All right, we're getting to the end here. So I'm just going to go over some last uh, information about how you'll submit an arts learning grant proposal. Again, the deadline is March 16th, 2023. You require any assistance in submitting this application, you know, uh, feedback, brainstorming, draft review, budget review, uh, help access, getting access to a computer, help with the application itself. Do not hesitate to reach out to us and we will as we always do, try to go above and beyond to make sure that you're getting the assistance that you need. Additional attachments. So um, you'll provide uh, your the primary teaching artist resume or bio. Work samples. These are optional, but highly recommended up to 10 files. And for the arts learning grant, this is typically, um, you know, uh, maybe examples of the teaching artist teaching, examples of the artist's work, the teaching artist's work examples or demos or mock-ups of what the students might create, uh, examples of, of student work that the teaching artist has you know, taught those students previously. Um, you'll see that there is an area on the application that asks for any notes you have related to the work samples that you've uploaded. And that, especially for the arts learning grant, is helpful to say like what is what. Um, and if you have additional documents like letters of support, press articles, or marketing samples, you're welcome to include those. Tips for the budget. I recommend working on the budget and the narrative together, um, or uh, even better, working on the budget first, because it can really be a map for the rest of your, propose, uh, your proposal. Check for consistency that if you change, say, in one place early on, you thought there were going to be 20 participants. And as you worked on the project, you realized there are really going to be 25. 
or 30, right? Make sure that then you, um, you know, do maybe a find on the document and make sure that you've changed that number everywhere as to not create a distraction to the panel or a, a point of confusion. Use the explanation column. You'll see that the budget form is embedded on the application itself. It has some categories for different line items like artist fees, art supplies and materials and so forth. There's an explanation column and then a column where you'll put the dollar amount. The explanation column is really important because that's how you show us how you got to that dollar amount. And the panel isn't wondering, you know, why is there, uh, why is it all, you know, it's all going to artist fees. There are three artists involved. Are they all getting paid the same amount? Are they getting paid different amounts? Using the explanation column is your way to make sure that those kinds of questions do not come up and that it's all very clear. Uh, check the guidelines, double check, triple check the guidelines for allowable and ineligible expenses. Um, a, you'll see on the budget form, there is a place for you to describe, um, or I'm sorry, the budget form is only going to ask you how you will be expending our grant funds. The um, There is a written question, a narrative question after that asks, if there are any additional expenses for the project and how you will pay for those. So that's your place to talk about if you got any additional grants, any additional funding that's a part of the project um, or additional expenses. And a helpful formula when thinking about your project as a whole, expenses minus your projected income equals your grant request amount. Always, please don't hesitate to ask us to review a draft of your budget. It's a very quick thing for us to do. Uh, I enjoy reviewing budgets. It makes me feel a little better knowing that I had some eyes on some of these budgets that are coming in and we can catch issues early on. So just don't hesitate to ask. The review criteria for the arts learning grant is artistic merit, project feasibility, and the impact of the project. You'll see that in the guidelines, we provide in-depth descriptions of what this means for the specific category. So take a look at that. I'll talk about it more. Uh, we will do an application overview session. I'll talk about review criteria more in that session. Um, and uh, those three areas are what the panel uses uh, to uh, uh, do numeric scores for the project. So uh, think about these when you're writing your proposal because this is what you will actually be scored on. And then if the pro uh, project was funded previously, uh, the panel will be also considering any any evidence of the project's growth or moves to self-sustainability. And if they ask, they will give them information on uh, final reports. Okay, last thing for arts learning grant, if uh, you're just getting started, the first thing uh, to do would be to secure a fiscal sponsor or a partner school if you need one. Uh, review the online application form and guidelines, be aware of what you're gonna need to submit. Complete the project eligibility form so that we can give you some feedback on your plans before you get too deep into the application. Organize digital copies of all the required attachments. There is nothing worse than um, uh, uh, at the last minute trying to make a whole bunch of PDFs or your things aren't uploading. So I recommend doing those early on. And at any time, please make an appointment with us to get additional.